Hello guys, this is uh, Charles Clinton speaking and this is video number five talking about different questions on the exam we got wrong. So it's question 695 to question 734. Let's see which questions we got wrong. So first question, pause the video so you get the gist of the question, but let's go through it. It's a 36-year-old um, G3, para 3, woman who complains of constipation. So she had, she's always already multi-gravid. And as you can see, pause the video, but some important points here are that she has cystocele and rectocele and is multi-gravid. So on the findings, in the exam, you can see that there is an obvious uh, cystocele, rectocele. X-ray shows a large amount of stool in the descendant colon, and surgery is planned for next week. Which of the following can be used in the interim to promote normal bowel movements? So the options for this question are A, digital compression of rectocele, B, manual disimpaction of the rectum, C, docusate tabs, D, soap buds enema, and E, frequent small meals high in fiber. So my answer to this question was soap suds enema, which was incorrect. We're going over the incorrect questions. The correct answer was digital compression of rectal seal. You can see the different students that answered correctly and incorrectly. Why is this? Because the patient has um, pelvic relaxation manifested through the cystocele and to, through the rectal seal. So transvaginal digital compression of rectal seal can restore the alignment and this mechanical obstruction. That was basically the answer. Why wasn't it soap suds or any of the other options? Any of the other options are good options, but aren't the best option. Because first step is trying to alleviate the mechanical obstruction. So soap suds would rehydrate the stool. So the stool moves and goes out of the colon. But if you have a mechanical obstruction, try to attack that first. Next question, 60 year old male seen in the clinic because of leg pain. So this guy has resting leg pain. He has manifestations of peripheral artery disease with resting leg pain. This isn't just intermittent claudication, it's resting leg pain. So the question is asking me, what is the best Next step, the options are arterial Doppler width, ankle brachial index, A, B, angiogram, C, celostosol, D, clopidogrel, and D and E, smoking cessation. So my answer was incorrect, which was smoking cessation. Why did I answer this? Because you usually try to do to better or improve risk factors and usually USMLE likes, uh, likes you going through what is from simple to most complex. But this patient has rest pain and rest pain, you can't sit there and wait for smoking cessation and, and other uh, lifestyle modifications. When you have rest pain, you need investigation and correction. So what would be the best next step? It would be an ankle brachial index. After this, depending on the findings, you can do an angiogram if, if a lesion is found. Celostosol and smoke cessation might work in patients without severe disease and clopidogrel will add nothing to the aspirin the patient already has. Actually, it will worsen uh, side effects and uh, bleeding risk. Next question, question nine. 40-year-old female is seen in the emergency department for upper 
right upper quadrant pain and fever. I want you guys to pause this and read it through, but basically they're talking to us about 40 year old female with call it uh, with right upper quadrant pain. She has already had stones in the past and she sometimes get this pain, gets this pain after a fatty meal. So she arrives to the emergency department and they assess her, finding that her biliary tract is within normal limits. They see gallstones, but no biliary duct dilation and labs are normal except for a bilirubin, total bilirubin of four, direct of 3.5, alkphos of 500, lipase is normal and amylase is five times the upper limit of normal. So what is the best next step? So the options are, one, serial LFTs, liver, liver function tests. Two, cholecystectomy. Three, ERCP, four, IV metronidazole and ciprofloxacin, and five, MRCP. So my answer in this case was, again, incorrect, was ERCP. Why was I going to, e to ERCP? Because ERCP, I was thinking it could give me a diagnosis and also the option of a, being a treatment modality. Why is this incorrect? Because the patient was otherwise doing fine. She is stable. She does not have a dilated biliary tract. And it seems like the stone has passed. So the best next step is to watch and wait. How? With serial liver function test. If she improves, go to elective cholecystectomy. If she worsens, go to ERCP and probably you'll add IV metro and ciprofloxacin. If you have a symptomatic um, jaundice, you'll probably go to the MRCP. Next question. 17-year-old female is brought in by her parents. So this story is of a girl that doesn't have insight about her different, uh, her low weight, her very low body mass index of 14.3. She feels fine. She says she is trying to look good. She eats, eats very little, but she has some derangements. She has metabolic derangements. She also has um, she, anemia. She has a low albumin. So this, this girl has severe anorexia nervosa. So this is something I didn't think about at the moment. So what was my answer? Well, the options were, what would you recommend to her parents at this time? The options are psychotherapy, benlafaxin, hospitalize the patient, classes on healthy living, and five, reassurance. But my answer was psychotherapy. Why is it incorrect? Because this patient needs hospitalization. This patient needs uh, to correct her derangements. She can undergo psychotherapy, venlafaxine, and the other options while hospitalized. But she has severe anorexia nervosa. So what are some clues USMLE will give you of severe anorexia nervosa? Aminorrhea, low BMI, less than 15, metabolic derangements, and poor insight. She has several of these, so you have to hospitalize her. Next question, 17-year-old male is seen for sports physical prior to starting the year on the baseball team. So what are you finding here? You can find that he has an asymptomatic hernia, inguinal hernia. So what is the next best step in the management? A, annual reassessment. B, abdominal binders during games. C, scrotal support. D, elective hernia repair. And E, reassurance. My answer was annual reassessment because I thought it out as it being asymptomatic, not affecting the patient, just finding it out 
and incidentally, and it probably wouldn't be any problem, but re remember, always repair hernias, even if they're asymptomatic, except the only hernia you do not repair electively, if asymptomatic, is a umbilical neonatal hernia because they usually will resolve spontaneously. All the others have a increased risk of first incarceration and then strangulation. And you don't want to operate in an emergent or an urgent manner when you could have done this years before. Next question, 16 year old male with a pertinent history of asthma is seen in the clinic. Thing is this uh, male has asthma and he would benefit from influenza vaccination due to the risk of having uh, asthma. So the question is, what, well, and he also has a reaction to eggs. He has egg allergy, which is manifested as general, generalized rash upon consumption without any airway or GI involvement. What is the best next step? So in this question, I didn't, let's see. Um, okay, this question was, answer is, or gist of the question is, for non-anaphylactic reactions, give the vaccine with 30 minutes observation. If the patient has anaphylactic reactions, give it in a controlled setting. Be ready to what might come upon, but always give the vaccine. Inactivated vaccine is the most commonly used and it is, it is what you will find probably in the exam. The live attenuated, I think it's no longer used after the influenza season between 2016 and 2017 due to its low efficacy. And the recombinant uh, vaccine has zero egg particles in it. So I would believe that if there's an option with the recombinant vaccine, probably it would be the best because you have no risk of getting a reaction. Remember, these videos are done on a daily basis. So some facts would could be missing. This is my daily growth. So if you find anything you could correct me on or any suggestion, or any, anything you want, would like to comment, this video will be on YouTube, so please do not hesitate on leaving your comment. Question 28, a mass casualty event is called after a gang fight between two rival gangs. Thing is that this, this patient lost uh, different things on his neurologic exam. The answer to this question is based on the neurological findings. And what is important here? What is important here is to remember that Brown's acquired syndrome is synonymous to saying hemisection of the spine, of the uh, medulla, of the spinal, of the spinal cord. Sorry, in Spanish, we, we call the spinal cord Medulla espinal, that, that is why I was thinking of medulla in English. Medulla oblongata is, is talking about, um, it's talking about what part of the brain. In, in Spanish we use different, well, that's not part of this, of this exam. So um, I, will, I won't rest until I get this. Medulla oblongata. Oh, medulla oblongata would be, wouldn't be the pons. It would be, check it up. We'll, we'll check it out. Mesencephalon? Hmm. I'll correct myself on the, on the comment section, okay? So Brown's acquired syndrome is hemisection of the spinal cord. So remember that pain ascends contralaterally by, that is why that is an important learning point at sense contralaterally. That's why on the other side of the patient, below the lesion level, you will have a, 
pain and temperature loss. But on the ipsilateral side, you will have vi vibration and proprioception loss, which goes in the uh, dorsal columns, and also motor loss ipsilaterally, which goes in the anterior part of the uh, spinal cord. And this is one of the last ones. 64-year-old male presents to your clinic with intermittent leg pain. He gets pain whenever he walks, more than a block. And okay, basically, there are tons of a patient that has, is symptomatic with a mild exertion, and um, he already has his medications. He has an angiogram which reveals two superficial femoral lesions. 2.5 centimeter lesion in the right popliteal artery and a 5 centimeter lesion on the left superficial femoral artery, which intervention is most appropriate at this time. So I just didn't remember of the fact or know the fact that I'll mention next. So the options are A, stent the left, bypass the right. B, stent the left and the right. C, Stent the right, bypass the left. D, bypass both lesions. So I didn't remember that. Stenting is performed for femoral lesions which are less than three centimeters long. All other lesions must be bypassed. So this patient had a femoral lesion, but it was five centimeters long. So both the lesions had to be bypassed. And this is the last question. You're attempting to devise a protocol that will prevent perioperative spread of infection. So the thing is that this patient will go to surgery and they're asking you which uh, antibiotic will you give this patient for or as prophylaxis. So I just thought it over too much. I didn't think simple and these are the options. A, ceftriaxone, vancomycin, piptazo, cefazolin, and clindamycin. My answer was clindamycin. I started thinking of uh, which one would attack anaerobes and this and that. I just didn't think simple and didn't think of what they do in my hospital, which is give a first generation cephalosporin. Almost all patients which are going to surgery in the surgical section of the hospital receive a first generation cephalosporin because they target basically or principally group A strep and staph aureus. And this would be, let's see, last question. 18 year old female is seen in clinic for weight gain and bloating. She is a varsity athlete, athlete who both swims and plays tennis. So in this question, what they're, they are telling us is that this patient has, um, they found she has been doubling her exercise regimen. She, she is generally doing okay with everything, but she is just finding that um, she has something in her belly. She, it, it's, it has like she has something like sticking out i wasn't sure why this was happening but there's a firm smooth mass in the right lower quadrant so this mass was so big that that was the thing that you could see from the distance in bimanual exam she, the uterus was displaced to the left with a large firm cystic structure impinging on the vaginal wall. An ultrasound reveals a 19 centimeter cyst. I thought it was, I read 19 millimeters. So I said, this is, a, this is small and didn't read centimeter, it's huge. So what is the best next step in her management? Okay, then let's look at the characteristics. It's done as it's a cyst without free fluid in the pelvis arising from the right and next. She is a young girl. She has no important history and something that big, which hasn't affected her uh, in different, um, hasn't generated new symptoms 
means this is probably ben benign. So if it's benign, what we will do with this patient, which is young and probably will want children? Okay, the correct answer, sorry for not giving you the options before, is cystectomy. This is suggestive of a serous cyst adenoma. She's young, so be the least traumatized and possible through cystectomy. And that's it for this video. Please do not hesitate to leave your feedback. Thank you very much.